might get you to uh, switch it off for me now or switch it to silent, thanks. Well, today, my friends, we're on a mission. We're on a mission from God. And in the words of Jake and Elwood that we uh, just heard, let's remember people that no matter who you are and what you do to live, thrive or survive, there are still some things that make sense and makes us all the same. You, me, them, and as our first song said, everybody. Well, welcome. My name is Carolyn Symes, and I've been given the job today of sending Ian off with as much laughter as we can. And I guess the Blues Brothers as a, an entrance was a, a good way to start. Whilst I will do my best today to keep our service upbeat, we still shouldn't lose sight of why we have all gathered together today. We're here to fa farewell a mate. Ian Donald Quincy, Quince to some, Quincy to others, Grandad Quincy to the grandkids. On behalf of his family, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Due to the current community environment that we find ourselves in, I know there are many who wish that they could be with us here in the chapel, but can't for circumstances beyond their control. So to those who have joined us remotely via the live stream, don't be afraid to laugh out loud at any stage during our service. Each one of you will have your own special memories and time spent with Ian. His down-to-earth, no-frills attitude to life, I'm sure, endeared him to many. Today is an important day as you have gathered together to honour a life and mourn the passing of someone who was integral and special in your life. Time stands still for just a moment as we do stand here to acknowledge that someone has touched our lives, has left an imprint on our hearts and that our souls are eternally changed. Ian may have left this life, but his spirit and his living made a difference and will continue to do so as long as each one of you remember him in your hearts and carry the lessons of his life with you. When someone we've shared some of our life with passes away, there is a change in our lives for the space they filled is now empty. So whatever your relationship to Ian was, know that although there is that hole left in your lives, it should be filled with memories and time spent together. As I said, each one of you will have your own memories of your times shared with Ian. But today is a sacred day, a special moment, a moment where we can let tears fall, where we can let laughter heal, and where you can share stories and begin the journey of turning those stories into precious memories. I want you to all remember today that Ian's story will carry you through the heart of all things. And even though his voice has been silenced by his passing, his story will speak to your living heart. So continue that story long after today is over. As this chapter in the story of your life closes, know that there will be many more chapters to come for you and that the pages of this chapter will never be forgotten. These pages where Ian lived will always be a part of your story. Well, let me share some of Ian's story with you now on behalf of his family. He was born on the 30th of October, 1943, to Alfred and Vera Quincy. He had one sister, Lorna, who was six years older than him and who died at age 81 on the 29th of January, 2019. After Ian's father returned from the war in 1946, the family set about building a new house at Maggie Street in Graceville. The house was ready in 1947. This was the only house the family ever lived in, and Ian only moved out when he married Sandra Wynne on the 14th of November in 1970. Ian went to Graceville Primary School, starting grade one in 1948, and later went to Indrapilly High School. After school, he had an apprenticeship as an electrician, but he didn't finish it. At some stage, he started working at H.B. Selby, first at Upper Roma Street and then at Kilroy Street in Milton when they moved to premises. And this is where he met Sandra, who started work there in 1966. Ian was a storeman, packer and delivery driver. Selby's were a scientific company who supplied chemicals and equipment to universities, schools and industry. And I'm hoping Sandra will recount some funny stories about that time a little later. 
In 1972, he had extra work after hours at a service station just off Upper Roma Street. Well, this site is now a backpacker's hostel. But back then, the service station was operated by little white cabs who were branching out into owning service stations throughout the city. Ian was selected to be the operator of an SO station at Everton Park. Do we all remember SO? It goes back a long way. So he left Selby's in mid-1972 and that SO site is now a KFC. Sandra had left Selby's to work at a local high school in the beginning of November 71, but she had to resign from the education department at the start of March 73 as she was pregnant. And pregnant women were not allowed to be employed at that time. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, that would have been a story that was recounted many times at the pub, I'm sure. Together, Ian and Sandra ran the service station and Gregory Ian was born on the 1st of November 1973. Everything was going well until a month later in December, after a month-long holiday, Ian was forced to leave the employment. There was some internal strife in the company and although it wasn't Ian's fault, he found himself unemployed with a family to support. After the 1974 floods had subsided and Brisbane was starting to get back to some sense of normal, Ian was offered a temporary job by his father-in-law at the CSIRO at Samford. Well, he started out chipping weeds with a hoe and ended up staying there for 19 and a half years, promoted to technical assistant along the way. He made a mechanical jaw to show how cows chewed and he was the only operator of a complicated seed sewing machine that he had to drive along the furrows in the soil and try and say that after you've had a few of those sherries. <laughs> On the 15th of December 1978, Ian and Sandra welcomed a daughter, Tanya Joy, and another on the 22nd of April 1980 when Susan Dawn was born. In, in mid-1993, CSIRO, along with many other companies at that time around Australia, were laying off staff. So Ian was once again looking for work. Although the bosses did ring him several times to get instructions on how the seed machine worked. Whilst most of the workers had been sacked, the bosses higher up had kept their jobs, but none of them knew how to uh, work the machine. Never I was going to say, I hope he never rang them back. <laughs> Yeah, good on him. Ian bought a truck with his redundancy payout and started a delivery company. But his expenses were more than his income, so he swapped to another company called Metro Express and got a bigger truck. He perse persevered with doing deliveries for a few more years, then sold the truck and became a yellow cab driver. And he loved it. No more lugging full filing cabinets up or down flights of stairs or delivering parcels where he ended up with only 50 cents out of the $5 charge because Metro Express took out their fees and taxes first. And there were times when he delivered to an address and no one was home, so he had to go back the next day. The change of job, though, set the wheels in motion for him to want some freedom. He announced in January 2005 that he wanted to leave the marriage and do his own thing. He signed the house over to Sandra and moved out. He found a flat at Margate and continued working for yellow cabs. He stayed in touch with his daughter Susan after he left and they enjoyed a, a close relationship. He did move to Ballarat in Victoria and in 2013 Susan got a phone call from Ballarat Hospital informing her that her father was in a very serious medical crisis. Several months later, Susan and her husband Adam flew to Ballarat and brought Ian back to a nursing home at Fairfield. They then found him a place at Jindalee where he received excellent care from the staff, but mostly from Susan. Even with three little girls in tow, Lily, who is seven, Ivy, who is five, and that's my middle name, so that makes you very special, and Emma, who is two, Susan still made her father's care her top priority. I know he will be missed by all his mates, but mostly by Susan and her family. Well, that was just a snapshot of Ian's life, and thanks, Sandra, for putting that together for us today. But I'm sure there's plenty more stories and memories in this room. 
Sharing memories and stories is such an important aspect of today's service. So with that in mind, we do have a few moments that we can spend listening to some stories and uh, memories. Please keep them clean. <laughs> I think Sandra's got some stuff that she would like to share first, and Laurie wants to speak as well. But if anyone else cares to, you might like to take a moment to gather your thoughts. Sandra, I'll just get the people on the live stream won't hear you unless you're on the microphone. Got used to projecting your voice. Yeah, but the live streamers won't hear okay. you. All right, love. Okay. I'm, I'm Sandra. I was married to Ian for 34 years. The best thing we ever got from out of that marriage was our three fantastic kids, Greg, who's here today, Susan, and Tanya, who couldn't be here. Now, um, I was thinking about saying I was giving Ian a slight roast and then I thought maybe not appropriate at a crematorium, maybe a little grilling today. <laughs> he was difficult to live with. He was moody, he could sulk for days and he never said sorry. But there were a couple of things that happened before I met him. When he first worked at Selby's, he didn't know how dangerous chemicals could be, particularly nitric acid. And I want Ryder to close his ears with this story. Um, he packed the nitric acid, the big flagons, and it was the really concentrated stuff that industry got, much more concentrated than what a high school or whatever would have. And he put rubber stoppers in the top, not knowing that nitric acid reacts with rubber and causes a fire. He packed the flagons into a wooden crate with sawdust around it so they didn't jostle, and it went on to a goods train waiting in a big line of carriages at Roma Street Station or Roma Street Goods Yards. Through the night, the acid ate out the bottom, they think, of one of the rubber stoppers. Once it got with the air, it flames everywhere, set fire to the sawdust, the other bottles burnt them up, burnt up the, the rubber stoppers, and the whole carriage burnt to the ground. There was just the wheels and the metal frame left. And I can remember seeing that in the paper, but I was only like 14, 15 years old. Another time, he and his friend Graham White from Selby's put liquid detergent in the new um, fancy fountain at Stones Corner. Do you remember that fountain, Annette and Laurie? That, the one that had like a starburst thing on it. Well, it went all night long and next day there was like foam, like up, you know, up chin high all around the fountain. And I saw a picture of that in the paper <laughs> again too. And anyway... Um, so when I first met the family and I was working at Selby's and his mother realised that I wasn't a floozy who was going to fleece the family of their jewels or valuables, I was allowed to go on the Sunday drive. The Sunday drive with Ian's family was you drove there, you did a big U-turn and you came back. Well, they, we were going to Wynnum and I thought, this is nice, I've never been to Wynnum before. And we pull into this car park and I'm getting ready to get out but he didn't stop, we kept going and I said, don't we get out? And he said, no, no, we, we're going back home again. His mother said she had to have a nice cup of tea. Then we went on a family drive to Toowoomba for the Carnival of Flowers. Well, there we did get out. We watched the parade. We bustled back, got in the car, went back home to his home where we, his mother had another nice cup of tea. So with Ian, with his electrical apprenticeship that he never finished, he thought himself as a bit of a home handyman. And I quickly learned that I had to wear rubber shoes or stand on a rubber mat when I used certain appliances because you'd get a, a tingle. The power would go off, he'd call up the stairs, it's okay, I'll put it back on again. And we were one of the first houses to ever get a safety switch because it, it saved his life so many times. He wired my mum's iron backwards and so when she went to iron something with it, it melted all over the sole plate and she had to get a new iron anyway. <laughs> no, she, she didn't, and he didn't say sorry. Um, so uh, when he was a home handyman, I mean, the, at the time, we were broke. We had no money. You couldn't afford an electrician or a carpenter. So you had to make do. You had to do it yourself. But he would use different screws. If you needed four screws in something, there'd be three, and they'd all be different. You'd have to have Phillips head and a, and a flat screwdriver. And then if they wouldn't go in, he'd hammer them in, which meant you'd never got them back out again. So he used chisels as screwdrivers and screwdrivers as chisels and he once hammered in some nails with our only spirit level. It was never right after that, Paul. It was a little black metal thing. It, it's, it's a little spirit levels went all funny. And in the end, the family motto was, because he'd say this so often, you'll get what you're given and like it. So um, 
I'm just going to say that if he... Oh, with cars. OK, so we had the um, SO workshop. Remember, SO puts a tiger in your tank. And he decided to change his steering wheel, Peter, of his blue ute. He had that blue ute and he put a fancy little racing car wheel on it. But he didn't tighten it up properly. I wasn't with him, luckily. He went round a corner and the steering wheel came off in his hand <laughs> and he put it back on again. He bought locking wheel nuts because he thought it'd make it look fancy and lost the key and spent months finding, asking people if they had a key that could be at the service station. And someone had a garage door key that actually worked opening the nuts because he had no way to get the wheels off. <laughs> and, um, oh, he burned out a car engine because he said that the previous owner had cut off the dipstick so it didn't reach down <laughs> into the, where the oil was. And he borrowed this Mitsubishi Colt from this guy who had a car yard and we were going for a Sunday drive and the, this front bench seat wasn't fastened down. So we went round a sharp corner and I went straight under the dashboard because <laughs> he was all right, he had the steering wheel. So I was going to say, my last bit here, if he had anything to do with making this coffin today, it would have glue and screws and nails. It would be on a lean because no spirit level and the trolley would have four different wheels on it. You know, or even, yeah. So that, that was living with Ian. He was... It was kind, he would help neighbours and friends and do everything, but sometimes he forgot, forgot his family. So that was the bit that I give him the roast for. So. Thanks, Sandra, for coming forward. Laurie, did you want to come and say a few words? Hi, I'm Laurie Sharrick. I was Ian's best friend for the best of 55 years. Um, he was the best man at my wedding and he really looked after me that day. Ian was very good at sport. Uh, he was very good at Aussie rules and cricket, and in cricket he could he could bat left or right-handed, which was a sight to see. He also had a flash British semi-racer bike. Uh, Rally was the brand. We were all very jealous of what he had. He worked at uh, Jackson's Produce and Seeds there at Roma Street, and he had to lug potato bags around which built his arm muscles up and shoulder muscles up no end. Uh, he was in the Indrapilly High School cadets and he was very interested in the signal side with radios. So that was for two years that I knew him there at Interpilly High. I wasn't in the same class because there was two industrial classes. We did chemistry, his, his lot didn't. We used to go to a great dance on a Friday night at the Hepper Hall at West End, which I believe is still going. Uh, they used to play the top 40 songs and Johnny Powell and the Planets were the house band. Jeff Atkinson, who was an announcer on 4BC, did all the comparing and they'd often have uh, interstate artists come up and do a bit of a show. We used to go to the Graceful in uh, Sherwood th Picture Theatres. And he also liked some of the rock and roll music. I know he liked a song called Papa Umau Mau that the Beach Boys and some others sang. And also he liked uh, The Lion Sleeps the Night, the Women Away one. And he he also helped me and my uncle do a concrete slab at uh, Stradbroke Island. And back then there was no gravel or no ready mix. 
and we used to use the dry sand that had come from a sand dune that had been pushed in into the bush because they had most of the salt washed out of it. But sometimes the flame and cement mixer would break down we'd have to mix it by hand on a sheet of metal. But that was a big help that he gave us with that. Uh, when we were at Stradbroke once, we were the only four-wheel drive down the beach and we were about halfway down and there was a lovely fishing reel just on the edge of the waves. And we looked around, couldn't see anyone, no four-wheel drive. So he said to Ian, go and pick that up, someone's dropped it out of their four-wheel drive. So Ian just got to it and there's a voice comes from the sand dunes. It was a bloke. He must have got taken short and gone to the toilet in the sand dunes. He said, hey, that's mine. So he, he had to put it back. Ian was the first person to teach me how to drink a beer. His mother said, I'll kill the first person that starts him off drinking. But he was quite an expert. I remember one time at Stradbroke, he came on the bus and he had a bottle of brand of vino, but he drank nearly all of it by the time he got home. Oh, another funny story, a mate of mine used to have a motorbike and Mrs Quincy would have killed Ian if she'd known he was on it. Now, come and flying round the Turinga Road and just then a dunny man with a can on his shoulder nearly walked in front of them, so it would have been a real old mess if they got caught up in that. Uh, Ian's mother bought him an E.H. Holden Anyway, I was over there the day they, they received it. And I said, I'll oh, give us a look at the engine, pull the bonnet up. He said, no, I can't do that. My mother will go mad at me. <laughs> well, that's probably about it. But he, he was a wonderful friend and uh, I'll miss him greatly. Thank you. Well, Sandra told me about her port. She used to enjoy a port and a little tiny glass, but um, Ian would say, can I have some, and, and then get a big glass yeah, <laughs> and drink all her port. You'd have your mile on it, and the bottle of port would be gone, the port would be gone. <laughs> was, there, was there anyone else who wanted to come forward to share a story? Yeah. Well, there's, there, there will be an opportunity after the service is over for you to gather together and share all those wonderful memories. Well, some pictures of Ian's life have been gathered together to help you with your memories today. So let's sit back, watch the TV screens and enjoy those memories now. I can't help thinking of a good night's sleep And the long, long roads of my life are a-calling me These rough old hands are a-glued to the wheel My eyes full of sand from the way they feel And the lights coming over the hill are a-blinding me It's a long, tough haul from a way down south A man's got to find a little bread for
I know they will tell about the night I died in the rain when the lights on the hill were a blinded me. Friends, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you once again for being together today. I think it's really special in this lovely environment for you to share this time. And I'm sure the comfort that you can give each other in the days to come will be paramount on your, the, your road to healing. After the service, you're invited to make your way down the driveway to the refreshments lounge where you can spend time together sharing all those memories, reminiscing and having a, a drink or two. I do know for certain that we never do lose the people that we love, even to death. They will continue to participate in every act, thought and decision that we do make. Their love leaves an indelible imprint on our memories. I hope you find comfort in knowing that your lives have been enriched by sharing some of it with Ian. I hope the memories that he's left behind will soften any of your grief. Try to find comfort and peace in the thought that having Ian in your life enriched it, and perhaps to a certain degree for some, made it complete. Time and space can never divide or keep Ian from your heart and from your mind. For those who are here today to simply offer Ian's family support, thank you, and know that the grief that they are feeling is exhausting and your support will be needed long after today is over. We should commit ourselves to the care and comfort of those who do grieve the most, not just today, but in the weeks and months ahead. Although Ian is physically absent, know that he will remain with you forever, for he does live on in your hearts and is as much a part of your lives as he was ever before. So we are here today to commit the body of Ian Donald Quincy to be cremated. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The wheel does turn ever and what came out of the earth must be returned. And now he is gone, cry for him a little, but not for too long. Think of him sometimes, but don't allow your thoughts to dwell too long on him being gone. Think of him now and again, as he was in life to you. Well, to end our service today, we'd like to have one last toast to Ian before we take him from the chapel back out to the hearse. So I'll invite the funeral directors to come forward to hand out the sherry, get you all to be upstanding, and be thankful that they're just little glasses and we'll only be a little tipsy.
down to Georgia, he was looking for a soul to steal. He was in a bind because he was way behind. He was willing to make a deal. When he came across this young man sewing on a fiddle and playing it hot, and the devil jumped up on a hickory stump and said, boy, let me tell you what. I guess you didn't know it, but I'm a fiddle player too. And if you'd care to take a dare, I'll make a bet with you. Now you play pretty good fiddle, boy, but give the devil his due. I bet a fiddle of gold against your soul because I think I'm better than you. The boy said, my name's Johnny and it might be a sin, but I'll take your bet you're going to regret because I'm the best it's ever been. Johnny, you're rising up your bow and play your fiddle hard. Cause hell's broke loose in Georgia and the devil deals the cards. And if you win, you get this shiny fiddle made of gold. But if you lose, the devil gets your soul. up his case and he said I'll start this show and fire flew from his fingertips as he rosined up his bow and he pulled the bow across the strings and it made an evil hiss and then a band of demons joined in and it sounded something like this Johnny said, well, you're pretty good, old son, but sit down in that chair right there and let me show you how it's done. Fire on the mountain, run, boys, run. The devil's in the house of the rising sun. Chicken in the bread pan, picking out dough. Granny says your dog back, no child, no. The devil bowed his head because he knew that he'd been beat. And he laid that golden fiddle on the ground at Johnny's feet. Johnny said, devil, just come on back if you ever want to try again. I done told you once, you son of a bitch, I'm the best as ever been. He played, found a mountain, run, boy, run. Devil's in the house of the rising sun. A chicken in the bread, better picking out dough. Granted, we don't fight no child, no. 